The following is a conversation with Pamela McCordick. She's an author who has written on the history and the philosophical significance of artificial intelligence. Her books include Machines Who Think in 1979, The Fifth Generation in 1983 with Ed Feigenbaum, who's considered to be the father of expert systems, The Edge of Chaos, The Features of Women, and many more books. I came across her work in an unusual way by stumbling in a quote from Machines Who Think that is something like, artificial intelligence began with the ancient wish to forge the gods. That was a beautiful way to draw a connecting line between our societal relationship with AI, from the grounded day-to-day science, math, and engineering, to popular stories and science fiction and myths of automatons that go back for centuries. Through her literary work, she has spent a lot of time with the seminal figures of artificial intelligence, including the founding fathers of AI from the 1956 Dartmouth Summer Workshop where the field was launched. I reached out to Pamela for a conversation in hopes of getting a sense of what those early days were like and how their dreams continue to reverberate through the work of our community today. I often don't know where the conversation may take us, but I jump in and see. Having no constraints, rules, or goals is a wonderful way to discover new ideas. This is the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on iTunes, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D-M-A-N. And now, here's my conversation with Pamela McCordick. In 1979, your book, Machines Who Think, was published. In it, you interview some of the early AI pioneers and explore the idea that AI was born not out of maybe math and computer science, but out of myth and legend. (laughs) So uh, tell me if you could the story of how you first arrived at the book, the journey of beginning to write it. I had been a novelist. I'd published two novels. And I was sitting under the portal at Stanford one day, the house we were renting for the summer, and I thought, I should write a novel about these weird people in AI I know. And then I thought, ah, don't write a novel, write a history. Simple, just go around, you know, interview them, splice it together, voila, instant book. Ha, ha, ha. It was much harder than that. But nobody else was doing it. And so I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. And there were people who, John McCarthy, for example, thought it was a nutty idea. There were much, you know, the field had not evolved yet, so on. And he had some mathematical thing he thought I should write instead. And I said, no, John, I am not a woman in search of a project. I'm, this is what I want to do. I hope you'll cooperate. And he said, oh, mutter, mutter. Well, okay, it's your, your time. What and was the pitch? For the, I mean, such a young field at that point, how do you write a personal history of a field that's so young? I said, this is wonderful. The founders of the field are alive and kicking and able to talk about what they're doing. Did they sound or feel like founders at the time? Did they know that they've been found, that they have founded something? Oh, yeah. They knew what they were doing was very important, very. What they, what I now see in retrospect is that they were at the height of their research careers. And it's humbling to me that they took time out from all the things that they had to do as a consequence of being there. And to talk to this woman who said, I think I'm going to write a book about you. No, it was amazing, just amazing. So who who stands out to you? Uh, maybe looking 63 years ago at the Dartmouth conference, the, so Marvin Minsky was there, McCarthy was there, Claude Shannon, Alan Newell, Herb Simon, some of the folks you've mentioned. Right. Um, then there's other characters, right? Um, the, one of your co-authors. <laughs> uh, he wasn't at Dartmouth. He wasn't at Dartmouth. No. But I mean, he was in a, general. I think an undergraduate then. <laughs> and uh, and of course Joe Traub. I mean, the, the, all of these are players, not at Dartmouth, but uh, in that era. Right. Uh, it's same you and so on. So who are the characters 
if you could paint a picture that stand out to you from memory, those people you've interviewed and maybe not people that were just in the in the uh, the atmosphere in the atmosphere. Uh, of course, the four founding fathers were extraordinary guys. They really were. Who are the founding fathers? Alan Newell, Herbert Simon, Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy. They were the four who were not only at the Dartmouth Conference, but Newell and Simon arrived there with a working program uh, called the Logic Theorist. Everybody else had great ideas about how they might do it, but they weren't going to do it yet. Um, and you mentioned Joe Traub, my husband. I, I was immersed in AI before I met Joe because I had been Ed Feigenbaum's assistant at Stanford. And before that, I had worked on a book by edited by Feigenbaum and Julian Feldman called Computers and Thought. It was the first textbook of readings of AI. And they they only did it because they were trying to teach AI to people at Berkeley. And there was nothing, you know, you'd have to send them to this journal and that journal. This was not the internet where you could go look at a, an article. So I was fascinated from the get-go by AI. I was an Eng English major. You know, what did I know? And uh, yet I was fascinated. And that's why you saw that historical, that literary background, which I, I think is very much a part of the continuum of AI, that the AI grew out of that same impulse. Was that, yeah, that tradition. What, what, was, what drew you to AI? How did you even think of it back, back then? What, what was the possibilities, the dreams? What, uh, what was interesting to you? <laughs> uh, the idea of intelligence outside the human cranium this was a phenomenal idea. And even when I finished Machines Who Think, I didn't know if they were going to succeed. I, in fact, the final chapter is very wishy-washy, frankly. Uh, well, succeed the field did. Yeah. yeah, so was there the idea that uh, AI began with the wish to forge the gods? So the, the spiritual component that we crave to create this other... Thing greater than ourselves. For those guys, I don't think so. Newell and Simon were cognitive psychologists. What they wanted was to simulate aspects of human intelligence, and they found they could do it on the computer. Minsky just thought it was a really cool thing to do. <laughs> Likewise, McCarthy. McCarthy had got the idea in 1949 when, when he was a Caltech student. And he listened to somebody's lecture. It's, it's in my book. I forget who it was. Uh, and he thought, oh, that would be fun to do. How do we do that? And he took a very mathematical approach. Uh, Minsky was hybrid. And Newland Simon were very much cognitive psychology. How can we simulate various things about, cog about human cognition? What happened over the many years is, of course, our definition of intelligence expanded tremendously. I mean, these days, biologists are comfortable talking about the intelligence of a cell, the intelligence of the brain, uh, the, not just human brain, but uh, the intelligence of any kind of brain. Uh, cephalopods, I mean, mm -hmm. An octopus is really intelligent by any man. We wouldn't have thought of that in the 60s, even the 70s. So all these things have worked in. And I did hear one behavioral uh, primatologist, Franz Duval, say, AI taught us the questions to ask. <laughs> yeah, this is what happens, right? It's uh, when you try to build it is when you start to actually ask questions, if it puts a mirror to ourselves. Yeah, right. So you were there in the middle of it. It seems like not many people were asking the questions that you were, or at least try, trying to look at this field the way you were. I was so low. I, when I went to get funding for this, because I needed somebody to transcribe the uh, interviews and I needed travel expenses, I went to 
everything you could think of, the NSF, the DARPA. Um, there was an Air Force place that doled out money. And each of them said, well, that was, that was very interesting. That's a very interesting idea, uh, but we'll think about it. And the National Science Foundation actually said to me in plain English, hey, you're only a writer. You're not a historian of science. And I said, yeah, that's true. But, you know, the historians of science will be crawling all over this field. I'm writing for the general audience. So I thought. And they still wouldn't budge. I finally got a private grant without knowing who it was from, from Ed Fredkin at MIT. He had, he was a wealthy man, and he liked what he called crackpot ideas, and he considered this a crackpot idea. This a crackpot idea, and he was willing to support it. I am ever grateful. Let me say that. You know, some would say that a history of science approach to AI, or even just a history or anything like the book that you've written, hasn't been written since. I mean, I don't, maybe I'm not familiar, but it's certainly not many. If we think about bigger than just these couple of decades, few decades, mm -hmm. what uh, what are the roots of AI? That, oh, you know? they go back so far. Yes, of course, there's all the legendary stuff, the golem and the early robots of the 20th century. But they go back much further than that. If you read Homer, Homer has robots in the Iliad. And a classical scholar was pointing out to me just a few months ago, well, you said you just read the Odyssey. The Odyssey is full of robots. It is, I said. Yeah, how do you think Odysseus's ship gets from place one place to another? He doesn't have the crew people to do that, the crew men. Uh, yeah, it's, it's magic. It's robots. Um, oh, I thought. How interesting. <laughs> uh, so we've had this notion of AI for a long time. And then toward the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, there were scientists who actually tried to make this happen some way or another. Not successfully. They didn't have the technology for it. And of course, Babbage in the 1850s and 60s he saw that what he was building was capable of uh, intelligent behavior. And he, when he ran out of funding, the British government finally said, that's enough. Uh, he and Lady Lovelace decided, oh, well, why don't we make, you know, why don't we play the ponies with this? <laughs> he had other ideas for raising money too. But if we actually reach back once again, I think people don't actually really know that robots do appear, or ideas of robots. You talk about the Hellenic and the Hebraic points of view. Oh, yes. Can you tell me about each? I defined it this way. The Hellenic point of view is robots are great. You know, they are party help. They help this guy Hephaestus, this god Hephaestus in his forge. I, I presume he made them to help him. Uh, and so on and so forth. And, and they, they welcome the whole idea of robots. The Hebraic view has to do with, I think it's the second commandment, uh, thou shalt not make any graven image. Mm -hmm. In other words, you better not start imitating humans because that's just forbidden. It's the second commandment. And a lot of the reaction to artificial intelligence has been uh, a, a sense that this is, this is somehow wicked. This is somehow blasphemous. We shouldn't be going there. Now, you can say, yeah, but there are going to be some downsides. And I say, yes, there are. But blasphemy is not one of them. You know, there is a kind of fear that feels to be almost primal. Uh, it, is there religious roots to that? Because so much of our society has religious roots. And so there is a feeling of, like you said, blasphemy, the, of, of creating the other, of creating something, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be artificial intelligence, it's creating life in general. Mm -hmm. It's the Frankenstein idea. There's the annotated Frankenstein on my coffee table. <laughs> uh, it's it's a tremendous novel. It really is just 
beautifully perceptive. Uh, yes, uh, we we do fear this, and we have good reason to fear it, but because it can get out of hand. Maybe you can speak to that fear, the, the psychology, if you've thought about it. You know, there's a practical set of fears, concerns in the short term. You can think of, if we actually think about artificial intelligence systems, you can think about bias of discrimination in algorithms. Or you, you can um, think about uh, their social networks have algorithms that recommend the content you see, thereby these algorithms control the behavior of the masses. There's these concerns, but it, to me, it feels like the fear that people have is deeper than that. So have you thought about the psychology of it? I think in a, a superficial way I have. There is this notion that if we produce a machine that can think, it will outthink us and therefore replace us. I guess that's a, that's a primal fear of yes, uh, almost, a, almost kind of a, a kind of mortality. So around the time you said you worked with, uh, uh, at Stanford with uh, Ed Feigenbaum. Mm -hmm. So let's look at that one person throughout his history, clearly a key person, one of the many in the history of AI. How has he changed uh, in general around him? How has Stanford changed in the last how many years are we talking about here? Oh, since decade. 65. 665. So maybe it doesn't have to be about him, it could be uh, bigger, but because he was a key person in expert systems, for example, how is that, how are these folks who you've interviewed in uh, the 70s, 79, changed through the decades? In Ed's case, I, I know him well, we are dear friends, we see each other every month or so. He told me that when Machines Who Think first came out, he really thought all the front matter was kind of baloney. Mm. And 10 years later, he said, no, I see what you're getting at. <laughs> yes, this is an impulse that has been, this has been a human impulse for thousands of years to create something outside the human cranium that has intelligence. Uh, I think it's very hard when you're down at the algorithmic level and you're just trying to make something work, which is hard enough, to step back and think of the big picture. It reminds me of uh, when I was in Santa Fe, I knew a lot of archaeologists which was a hobby of mine. And I would say, yeah, yeah, well, you can look at the shards and say, oh, this came from this tribe and this came from this trade route and so on. But what about the big picture? And a very distinguished archaeologist said to me, they don't think that way. You do, no, they're, they're trying to match the shard to, the, to where it came from. That's, you know, where did this corn the remainder of this corn come from? Was it grown here? Was it grown elsewhere? And I think this is part of the AI, uh, any scientific field. Uh, you're so busy doing the, the hard work, and it is hard work, that you don't step back and say, oh, well, now let's talk about the, you know, the, the general picture, meaning yeah. of all this, yes. Yeah, so none, none of the, even Minsky and McCarthy, they, the, oh, those in, guys did. Yeah, the founding fathers did. Early on, or pretty later? early on. Well, they had, but in a different way from how I looked at it. The two cognitive psychologists, Newell and Simon, they wanted to imagine reforming cognitive psychology so that we would really, really understand the brain. Yeah. Minsky was more speculative. And John McCarthy saw it as, I think I'm doing, doing him right by this, he really saw it as a great boon for human beings to have this technology. And that was reason enough to do it. Uh, and he had wonderful, wonderful fables about how if you do the mathematics, you will see that 
these things are really good for human beings. And if you had a technological objection, he had an answer, a technological answer. But here's how we could get over that, and then blah, 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 blah. And one of his favorite things was what he called the literary problem, which, of course, he presented to me several times. That is, everything in literature, there are conventions in literature. One of the conventions is that you have uh, a villain and uh, a hero. And the hero in most literature is human, and the villain in most literature is a machine. And he said, no, that's just not the way it's going to be. But that's the way we're used to it. So when we tell stories about AI, it's always with this paradigm. I thought, yeah, he's right. You know, looking back, uh, it, the classics, R.U.R. is certainly the machines trying to overthrow the humans. Frankenstein is different. Frankenstein is a creature. He never, he never has a name. Frankenstein, of course, is the guy who created him, the human, Dr. Frankenstein. This creature wants to be loved, wants to be accepted. And it is only when Frankenstein turns his head, in fact, runs the other way, and the creature is without love, that he becomes uh, the monster that he later becomes. So who's the villain in Frankenstein? It's unclear, right? It's, oh, it is uh, unclear, yeah. It's really the people who drive him, by yeah. driving him away, Right. they bring out the worst. That's right. They give him no human solace. Yeah. And uh, he is driven away. You're right. Uh, he becomes at one point the friend of a blind man. And they he serves this blind man and they become very friendly. But it, when the sighted people of the blind man's family come in, ah, I, you, you're, you've got a monster here. So it's it's very didactic in its way. And what I didn't know is that Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley were great readers of the literature surrounding abolition in the United States, the abolition of slavery. And they picked that up wholesale. Um, you know, you are making monsters of these people because you won't give them the respect and love that they deserve. Do you have, if we get uh, philosophical for a second, uh, do you worry that once we create machines that are a little bit more intelligent, let's look at Roomba that vacuums <laughs> the cleaner, that that this darker part of human nature where we abuse uh, the other, the, the somebody who's different will come out? I don't worry about it. I could imagine it happening. Uh, but I think that what, AI has to offer the human race will be so attractive that <laughs> yeah. people will be won over. So you have looked deep into these people, have deep conversations, and it's yeah. interesting to get a sense of stories of the way they were thinking and the way it was changed, the way your own thinking about AI has changed. So you mentioned McCarthy is, um, what, what about the years at CMU, oh. Carnegie Mellon, with Joe uh, and with- Sure. With uh, Joe was uh, not in AI. He was uh, in algorithmic complexity. Was there always a line between AI and computer science, for example? Is AI its own place of outcasts? Was that the feeling? There was a kind of outcast period for AI. For instance, in 1974, uh, the new field was hardly 10 years old. Uh, the new field of computer science was asked by the Na National Fi Science Foundation, I believe, but it may have been the National Academies, I can't remember, uh, to, you know, tell us, tell are your fellow scientists where computer science is and what it means. And they wanted to leave out AI. <laughs> And they only agreed to put it in because Don Knuth said, hey, this is important. 
You can't just leave that out. Really? Don? Dude? Don Knuth, yes. <laughs> I talked to him recently too, so out of all the people. Yes, uh, but you see, <laughs> yeah. an AI person couldn't have made that argument. He wouldn't have been believed, but Knuth was believed, yes. So uh, Joe Traub worked on uh, the real stuff. <laughs> uh, Joe was working on algorithmic complexity, but he would say, in plain English, again and again, the smartest people I know are in AI. Really? Oh, yes, no question. Anyway, Joe loved these guys. What happened was that, I guess it was as I started to write Machines Who Think, Herb Simon and I became very close friends. He would walk past our house on Northumberland Street every day after work, and I would just be putting my cover on my typewriter, and I would lean out the door and say, Herb, would you like a sherry? <laughs> and Herb almost always would like a sherry. <laughs> so he'd stop in, and we'd talk for an hour, two hours. My journal says we talked this afternoon for three hours. Mm. What so, was on his mind at the time, if uh, in terms of on, on the AI side of things? Oh, we didn't talk too much about AI. We talked about other things. Just life. Yeah. Uh, we, we both love literature, and Herb had read Proust in the original French twice all the way through. I can't. I've read it in English in translation. Uh, so we talked about literature. We talked about languages. We talked about music because he loved music. We talked about art because he was he was actually uh, enough of a painter that he had to give it up because he was afraid it was interfering with his research. Hmm. And so on. So, no, it was really just chat-chat, but it was very warm. So one summer, I said to Herb, you know, my students have all the really interesting conversations. I was teaching at the University of Pittsburgh then in the English department. Uh, you know, they get to talk about the meaning of life and that kind of thing. And what do I have? I, I have university meetings where we talk about the photocopying budget and, you know, whether the course on romantic poetry should be one semester or two. Right. So Herb laughed. He said, yes, I know what you mean. He said, but you know, you, you could do something about that. Dot, that was his wife, Dot and I used to have a salon at the University of Chicago every Sunday night. And we would have essentially an open house and people knew it wasn't for sure, a small talk. It was really for some topic of, of uh, depth. He said, but my advice would be that you choose the topic ahead of time. Fine, I said. So the following, we, we exchanged mail over the summer. That was U.S. Post in those days because <laughs> you didn't have personal email. Right. And um, we, I decided I would organize it, and there would be eight of us, Alan Newell and his wife, Herb Simon and his wife, Dorothea. Um, there was a novelist in town, a man named Mark Harris. He had just, ar just arrived, and his wife, Josephine. Uh, Mark was most famous then for a novel called Bang the Drum Sol Slowly, which was about baseball. Mm -hmm. And Joe and me, so eight people. And we met monthly, and we, we just sank our teeth into really hard topics, and it was great fun. How have your own views around artificial intelligence changed in through the process of writing machines who think and afterwards the ripple effects i was a little skeptical that this whole thing would work out it didn't matter to me it was so audacious the whole thing being ai ai generally yeah. yeah and in some ways uh it hasn't worked out the way i expected so far that is to say there is this wonderful lot of apps thanks yeah. to deep learning and so on yeah. but those are algorithmic yeah and in the part of uh symbolic processing there's very little yet yes and that's a field that lies waiting for industry and uh, industrious graduate students <laughs> maybe you can tell me some figures that popped up in your life in the 80s with expert systems where there was 
the symbolic AI possibilities of what's, you know, that what most people think of as AI, if you dream of the possibilities of AI, is really expert systems. Mm -hmm. And those hit a few walls and there was challenges there. And I think, yes, they will reemerge again with some new breakthroughs and so on. But what did that feel like, both the possibility and the winter that followed, the slowdown in research? Ah, you know, this whole thing about AI winter is, to me, a crock. It's no winters. Because I look at the basic research that was being done in the 80s, which is supposed to be, my God, it was really important. It was laying down things that nobody had thought about before. But it was basic research. You couldn't monetize it. Hence the winter. Hence the winter. Yeah, you know, research, scientific research, goes in fits and starts. It isn't this nice, smooth, oh, this follows this, follows this. No, well, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Well, the interesting thing, the way winters happen, it's never the fault of the researchers. It's the it's the the some source of hype over promising. Well, no, let me take that back. Sometimes it is the fault of the researchers. <laughs> Sometimes certain researchers might overpromise the possibilities. They themselves believe that we're just a few years away. Sort of just recently talked to Elon Musk and he believes he'll have an autonomous vehicle. We'll have autonomous vehicles in a year. I, and he believes it. A year? A year, yeah. We'll have mass deployment of autonomous. Uh, for the record, this is 2019 right now. Yes. So he's talking 2020 do the impossible, you really have to believe it. Mm. And I think what's going to happen when you believe it, because there's a lot of really brilliant people around him, is some good stuff will come out of it. Some unexpected, brilliant breakthroughs will come out of it, when you really believe it, when you work that hard. Oh, but I believe that, and I believe autonomous vehicles will come, I just don't believe it'll be in <laughs> yeah. a year. Yeah. I wish. But nevertheless, there is, autonomous vehicles is a good example. There's a feeling Many companies have promised by 2021, by 2022, Ford, GM, basically every single automotive company has promised they'll have autonomous vehicles. So that kind of overpromise is what leads to the winter because we'll come to those dates, there won't be autonomous vehicles, and there'll be a feeling, well, wait a minute, if we took your word at that time, that means we just spent billions of dollars, had made no money, and there's a counter response to where everybody gives up on it. Sort of intellectually, at, at every level, the hope just dies. And all that's left is a few basic researchers. So you're uncomfortable with some aspects of this this idea. Well, it's, it's the difference between science and commerce. So you think science prevail, science goes on the way it does? Oh, with, with, sci science can really be killed by not getting proper funding or timely funding. Um, I think Great Britain was a perfect example of that. The Lighthill Report in, you don't remember the year, something. essentially yeah. said, there's no use Great Britain putting any money into this. It's, it's going nowhere. And this was all about social factions in Great Britain. Uh, Edinburgh hated Cambridge and Cambridge hated Manchester. And you know, Somebody else can write that story. Uh, <laughs> but it really did have a, a hard effect on research there. Now, they've come roaring back with deep mind. Yeah. But that's one guy and his visionaries around him. But just to push on that, it's kind of interesting. You have this dislike of the idea of an AI winter. The, where's that, where's that coming from? Where, where, where do you? Oh, because it's, I just don't think it's true. There, uh, there was a particular periods of time. There, it's a romantic notion, certainly. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I admire science, perhaps, more than I admire commerce. Commerce is fine. Hey, you know, we all got to live. But uh, science has a much longer view than commerce yeah. and continues almost regardless. Not, it, it can't continue totally regardless. 
but it, almost regardless of what's saleable and what's not, what's monetizable and what's not. So the winter is just something that happens on the commerce side and the science so it seems marches. That's a beautifully um, optimistic and inspiring message. I agree with you. I think uh, if we look at the key people that work in AI, that work in key scientists in most disciplines, they continue working out of the love for science, no matter the, f you can always scrape up some funding to stay alive. And they continue working diligently. But there certainly is a huge amount of funding now. And there's a concern on, on the AI side and deep learning. There's a concern that we might, with overpromising, hit another slowdown in funding, which does affect the number of students, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I know it does. So the kind of ideas you had in Machines Who Think, did you continue that curiosity through, through the decades that followed? Yes, I did. And what what was your view, historical view, of how AI community evolved, the conversations about it, the, the work? Has it persisted the same way from its birth? No, of course not. I, it's just as we were just talking, the uh, symbolic AI really kind of dried up and it all became algorithmic. I, I remember a young AI student telling me what he was doing, and I had been away from the field long enough. I, I'd gotten involved with complexity at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, I, th I thought, algorithms, yeah, they're in the service of, but they're not the main event. No, they became the main event. Uh, that surprised me. But, And we all know the downside of this. We all know that... If you're using an algorithm to make decisions based on a gazillion human decisions, baked into it are all the mistakes that humans make, the bigotries, the short-sightedness, so on and so on. So you mentioned Santa Fe Institute. I, you, so you've written the novel, Edge of Chaos, but it's inspired by the ideas of complexity, a lot of which have been extensively explored at the Santa Fe Institute. Right. It's a, I mean, it's it's another fascinating topic of just sort of emergent complexity from chaos. Nobody knows how it happens really, but it seems to where all the interesting stuff does happen. <laughs> right. So how do first, not your novel, but just complexity in general and the work at Santa Fe fit into the bigger puzzle of the history of AI, or and maybe even your personal journey through that. One of the last projects I did concerning AI in particular was looking at the work of Harold Cohen, the painter. And Harold was deeply involved with AI. He was a painter first, and and what his project, Aaron, which was a lifelong project, did was reflect his own cognitive processes. Okay. H Harold and I, even though I wrote a book about it, we had a lot of friction between us. And I went, I thought, this is it. You know, the book died. It was published and fell into a ditch. Uh, this is it. I'm finished. It's time for me to do something different. By chance, this was a sabbatical year for my husband, and we spent two months at the Santa Fe Institute and two months at Caltech, mm -hmm. and then the spring semester in Munich, Germany. Okay. Those two months at the Santa Fe Institute were so restorative for me and I began to, it, this, the institute was very small then. Uh, it was in some kind of office complex on Old Santa Fe Trail. Everybody kept their door open. So you could crack your head on a problem. And if you finally didn't get it, you could walk in to see Stuart Kaufman or um, well, any number of people and say, I don't get this. Can you explain? And one of the people that I was talking to about complex adaptive systems was Murray Gell-Mann. 
And I told Murray what Harold Cohen had done. I said, you know, this sounds to me like a complex adaptive system. And he said, yeah, it is. Well, what do you know? Harold's Aaron had all these kissing cousins all over the world in science and in economics and so on and so forth. I was so relieved. I thought, okay, your instincts are okay. <laughs> you're, you're doing the right thing. Um, I didn't have the vocabulary. And that was one of the things that the Santa Fe Institute gave me. If I could have rewritten that book, no, it had just come out. I couldn't rewrite it. I would have had a vocabulary to explain what Aaron was doing. Okay, so I got really interested in uh, what was going on at the Institute. The people were, again, bright and funny and willing to explain anything to this amateur. George Cowan, who was then the head of the Institute, said he thought it might be a nice idea if I wrote a book about the Institute. And I thought about it, and I, I had my eye on some other project, God knows what. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, George, yeah, I, I'd really love to do it, but, you know, just not going to work for me at this moment. And he said, oh, well, too bad. I think it would make an interesting book. Well, he was right and I was wrong. I wish I'd done it. But that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, that that was a, a road not taken that I wish I'd taken. Well, you know what, this, just on that, on that point, it's quite brave for you as, an, as, a, as a writer, as, a, as sort of coming from a world of literature, the literary thinking, historical thinking, I mean, just from that world and bravely talking to quite, I assume, large egos <laughs> in, yeah. uh, in, <laughs> in uh, AI or in complexity and so on. How'd you do it? <laughs> like, where did you, I mean, I suppose they could be intimidated of you as well, because it's two different worlds coming I don't together. Think, I, I never picked up that anybody was intimidated by me. But how were you brave enough? Where did you find the guts to God, sort of- just dumb, dumb luck. I mean, I, I, this is an interesting rock to turn over. I'm gonna write a book about it. And you know, people have enough patience with writers if they think they're gonna, end up in a book that they let you flail around and so on. It's, well, but they also look if the writer has, there's like, if there's a sparkle in their eye, if they get it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right. When were you at the Santa Fe Institute? Uh, the time I'm talking about is 1990, yeah, 1990, 91, 92. But we then, because Joe was an external faculty member, we're in Santa Fe every summer. We bought a house there. And I didn't have that much to do with the Institute anymore. I was writing my novels. I was doing whatever I was doing. But I loved the Institute, and I loved the, again, the audacity of the ideas. That really appeals to me. I think that the, there's this feeling, much like in great, great institutes of neuroscience, for example, that um, it's they're, they're in it for the long game of understanding something yeah. fundamental about yeah. reality and nature. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really exciting. So um, if we start to, now to look a little bit more recently, how, you know, AI is really popular today. How is this world you mentioned the algorithmic, but in general, is the spirit of the people, the kind of conversations you hear through the grapevine mm -hmm. and so on, is that different than the roots that you remember? No. The same kind of excitement, the same kind of, this is really gonna make a difference in the world. And it will, it has. You know, a lot of the folks, especially young, you know, 20 years old or something, they, they think we've just found something special here. We're going to change the world tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, on a time scale, do you have a sense of what, of the time scale at which breakthroughs in AI happen? I really don't, because lo look at deep learning. That was a, Jeffrey Hinton came up with the algorithm in 86. Mm -hmm. But it took all these years for the technology to be good enough to actually be be applicable. 
So, no, I can't predict that at all. I can't. I wouldn't even try. <laughs> well, let me ask you to not to try to predict, but to speak to the, you know, I'm sure in the 60s, as it continues now, there's people that think, let's call it, we can call it this fun word, the singularity. Mm. When there's a phase shift, there's some profound feeling where we're all really surprised by what's able to be achieved. I'm sure those dreams were there. I remember reading quotes in the 60s and those sure. continued. How have your own views, maybe if you look back, about the timeline of a singularity changed? Well, um, I'm not a big fan of the singularity as Ray Kurzweil has presented it. How would you define the Ray Kurzweil? Sort of how would you well, it, how do you think of singularity in those skin? If I understand Kurzweil's view, it's sort of there's going to be this moment when machines are smarter than humans and you know, game game over. However, the game over is. I mean, do they put us on a reservation? Do they etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And first of all, machines are smarter than humans in some ways all over the place. Yeah. And they have been since adding machines were invented. So it's not it's not gonna come like some great eatable crossroads, you know, where they meet each other and our offspring Oedipus says you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Yeah, so it's already game over with calculators, right? Uh, <laughs> they're already out to do much better at uh, basic arithmetic than us. But, you know, there's a um, human-like intelligence. Mm. And it's not the ones that destroy us, but, you know, somebody that you can have as a, f as a friend. Oh. <laughs> you can have deep connections with. That kind of passing the Turing test and beyond. Mm those kinds of ideas have you dreamt of those oh yes 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 those possibilities uh, in a book i wrote with ed feigenbaum there is a little story called the geriatric robot okay. and how i came up with the geriatric robot is a story in itself but here's here's what the geriatric robot does it doesn't just clean you up and feed you and wheel you out into the sun it's great advantages, it listens. It says, tell me again about the great coup of 73. Yeah. Tell me again about how awful or how wonderful your grandchildren are, yeah. and so on and so forth. And it isn't hanging around to inherit your money. It isn't hanging around because it can't get any other job. This is its job. Yeah and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I would love something like that. Yeah, I mean, for me, that d deeply excites me. So I, I think there's a, a lot of us- Lex, you gotta know, it was a joke. I dreamed it up because I needed to talk to college students and I needed to give them some idea of what AI might be. And they sure. were rolling in the aisles as I elaborated and elaborated and elaborated. Uh, when it went into the book, they took my hide off in the New York Review of Books. This is just what we have thought about these people in AI. They're inhuman. Oh, huh. come on, get over it. Don't you think that's a good thing for the world, that AI could potentially? Moi, I do, absolutely. And furthermore, I want, you know, I'm pushing 80 now. Uh, by the time I need help like that, I also want it to roll itself in a corner and shut the fuck up. <laughs> let me let me linger on that point. Do you really though? Yeah, I do. Here's why. Don't you want it to push back a little bit? A little, but I have watched my friends go through the whole issue around having help in the house. And some of them have been very lucky and had fabulous help. And some of them have had people in the house who want to keep the television going on all day, oh, so who want to talk on their phones all day. No. So basically... Just roll yourself in the corner and <laughs> Unfortunately, us humans, when we're assistants, we, uh, we care, we're still, even when we're assisting others, we care about ourselves more. Of course. And so you create more frustration. And, and 
a robot a- AI assistant can really optimize the experience Wait, for you. I was just speaking to the point, uh, you actually bring up a very, very, very good point, but I was speaking to the fact that us humans are a little complicated, that we don't necessarily want a perfect servant. I don't, maybe you disagree with that, but uh, there's, um, I, I think uh, there's a push and pull with humans. Mm-hmm. A little You're tension, right. a little mystery that, uh, of course, that's really difficult for AI to get right, but. I do sense, especially in today with social media, that people are getting more and more lonely, even young folks, and sometimes especially young folks. That loneliness, there's a longing for connection, and AI can help alleviate some of that loneliness. Some, just somebody who listens, like in person. Um, that So to me, speak. So to speak. So to, so so to speak, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, that to me is is, is uh, really exciting. But so if we look at that that level of intelligence, which is exceptionally difficult to achieve actually, as the singularity or whatever, that's the human level bar, that people have dreamt of that too. Turing dreamt of it. Uh, he had a date, timeline. Do you have, how have your own timeline evolved on, don't I don't even think about it. You don't even think. No. Just this field has been so full of surprises for me. <laughs> but you just take it in and see. Yeah, the I, fundamental wow, wow that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's. I just can't. Maybe that's because I've been around the field long enough to think. Mm-hmm. You know, don't don't go that way. Herb Simon was terrible about making these predictions of when this and that would happen. Right. And he was a sensible guy. Yeah. But and his quotes are often used, right, as a... As look. a bludgeon, yeah. Yeah. Do you have concerns about um, AI, the existential threats that many people, like Elon Musk and, and uh, Sam Harris and others that are thinking about? Oh, yeah, about? yeah. That takes up a half a chapter in my book. <laughs> I call it the male gaze. <laughs> well, yeah. you hear yeah. me out. Um, the male gaze is actually a term from film criticism. And I'm blocking on the woman's who dreamed this up. But she pointed out how most movies were made from the male point of view. That women were objects, not subjects. They didn't have any uh, agency, and so on and so forth. So when... Elon and his pals and Hawking and so on came. <gasps> AI is going to eat our lunch and our dinner and our midnight snack too. I thought, what? And I said to Ed Feigenbaum, ah, oh, this is the first guy. First, these guys have always been the smartest guy on the block. And here comes something that might be smarter. Ooh, let's stamp it out before it <laughs> takes over. And Ed laughed. He said, I didn't think about it that way. But I did. I did. And it is the male gaze, you know. Okay, suppose these things do have agency. Well, let's wait and see what happens. <laughs> Can we imbue them with ethics? Can we imbue them with a sense of empathy? Or are they just going to be, uh, I don't know, we've had centuries of guys like that. <laughs> That's interesting that... Um... The, the ego, uh, the, the male gaze is immediately threatened. And so you can't think in a patient, calm <laughs> way of, of uh, how the tech could evolve. I mean, speaking of which, your 96 book, The Future of Women, oh, I think you. at the time and now, certainly now, I mean, I'm sorry, maybe at the time, but I'm more cognizant of now is uh, extremely relevant. You and Nancy Ramsey talk about four possible futures right. of women in science and tech. So if we look at the decades before and after the book was released, can you tell a history, sorry, of women in science and tech and oh, how boy. it has evolved? How have things changed? Where do we stand? Not enough. 
<laughs> they have not changed enough. The way that women are ground down in computing is simply unbelievable. But what are the four possible futures for women in oh. tech from the book? What you're really looking at are various aspects of the present. So for each of those, you could say, oh yeah, we do have backlash. Look at what's happening with abortion and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have one step forward, one step back. The Golden Age of Equality was the hardest chapter to write. And I used something from the Santa Fe Institute, which is the sand pile effect, that you drop sand very slowly onto a pile, and it grows and it grows and it grows, until suddenly it just breaks apart. And in a way, Me Too has done that. That was the last drop of sand that broke everything apart. That was a perfect example of the sand pile effect. And that made me feel good. It didn't change all of society, but it really woke a lot of people up. But are you in general optimistic about maybe after Me Too? I mean, Me Too is about a very specific kind of thing. Boy, but, solve that and you solve everything. But are you in general optimistic about the future? Of... Yes, I'm, I'm a congenital optimist. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. What about AI? What are your thoughts about when, the when, future when, of AI? I, of course, I get asked, what do you worry about? And the one thing I worry about is the things that we can't anticipate. <laughs> you know, there, there's going to be something out of left field that we'll, we will just say, we weren't prepared for that. Uh, I am generally optimistic. When I first took up being interested in AI, like most people in the field, more intelligence was like more virtue. You know, what could be bad? Right. And in a way, I still believe that, but I realize that my notion of intelligence has broadened. There are many kinds of intelligence, and we need to imbue our machines with those many kinds. So you've now just finished, or are in the process of finishing your the book that you've mm -hmm. been working on, a memoir. What, how have you changed? I know it's just writing, but how have you changed the process? If you look back, what kind of stuff did it bring up to you that surprised you? looking at the entirety of it all? The biggest thing, and it really wasn't a surprise, is how lucky I was. Mm -hmm. Oh my! To be, to have access to the beginning of a scientific field that is going to change the world. How did I luck out? <laughs> and Yes, of course, my, my view of things has widened a lot. If I can get back to one feminist part of our conversation, sure. without knowing it, it really was subconscious, I wanted AI to succeed because I was so tired of hearing that intelligence was inside the male cranium. And I thought if there was something out there that wasn't a male thinking and doing well, then that would put a lie to this whole notion of intelligence resides in the male cranium. That's... I did not know that until one night Harold Cohen and I were having a glass of wine, maybe two, and he said, what drew you to AI? And I said, oh, you know, smartest people I knew, great project, blah, blah, blah. And I said, and I wanted something besides male smarts. <laughs> <laughs> and it just bubbled up out of me, Lex. And I, what? It's what? Kind of, it's What's kind this? of brilliant, actually. So AI really uh, humbles all of us and humbles the people that need to be humbled the most. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> ah, wow, that is so beautiful. Pamela, thank you so much for talking today. Oh, it was really it's been a huge a great honor. Great pleasure. Thank you.